Praise the Lord, everyone. It is Wednesday night, the 17th of January, 2024. A brand new year. It is time for our midweek Bible study. You might notice I have a little bit different a uh, backdrop today. We, uh, I decided instead of just sitting in the living room doing the Bible study there, which kind of almost looks too casual, you know. Uh, I look like an old fat man sitting in a chair just talking, you know. So I thought maybe we would do something a little bit different. And uh, so Tommy and I have um, set it up here in our, our study, our office at the house so that we can do our Wednesday night Bible study from right in here. And I think it'll be a little bit more interesting um, a viewpoint for y'all who are watching. And, uh, you know, and it feels a little bit better for me, okay? Uh, a couple of quick things. One, I did receive a notification from my brother, my youngest brother today. Uh, my mother was taken to the hospital today, unable to talk. He doesn't know what happened to her yet. Uh, so we're waiting to hear news. Um, but she, I don't even know what exactly he meant by she wasn't able to talk. I'm assuming that perhaps it's uh, stroke-like symptoms. So we're waiting to hear um, news on that. But I'd ask you to keep her in prayer, if you would please. Uh, I also want to point out on a, on a good note that our Bible study, last week's Bible study, in one week's time, we have achieved 330 views as of today. That is in one week's time. We praise God for that. Somebody, folks, is watching. I wish that the viewership of our studies would uh, translate into local uh, church participation. So far it has not. However, you know, hopefully in the future it will at some level. Uh, we still need folks to come out and help us. We're trying to build a church, folks. And a church unlike any church you've ever been a part of, before in your life. Uh, we have a vision to do many, many wonderful, wonderful things. There are things I'd already be doing if I had a handful of people. You know, I'm, I'm not the kind of preacher who sits around waiting for hundreds to come in before I start doing things. No, there are many, many things we could be doing tomorrow if we had even five or six people that wanted to participate and be faithful and, and support the church with their attendance. We've already invested in a very nice karaoke system. We want to be able to do a karaoke night and give the community an opportunity to have some activity that uh, they can get together with other members of the community and have a good time. Uh, that we believe in providing social opportunities, not just, you know, preaching and teaching all the time. <clears throat> but we believe one of the um, functions of the church, one of the opportunities for the church to minister to our community is by providing some social outlets and give people a, an opportunity to meet, mingle, uh, network, however you want to, you know, uh, frame it. And so we could be doing karaoke, but quite frankly, we can't do all this stuff with just Tommy and I. It's impossible. We can't do it. So if we can get some people here in Huntsville, uh, to come out and help us, then we can start doing some really exciting things. I have another project in the works. Um, we're approaching it not as a ministry thing, but as a personal business uh, venture. 
Um, I can't go into a lot of details about it, but I will simply say that what it would be like uh, is we would be creating a members-only social club here in Huntsville. And uh, the club is, as I envision it, is going to have a whole lot of stuff going on that I think would be beneficial to members. Say, why members only? Well, part of that is because we are in a an area of the country where a lot of uh, LGBT people, quite frankly, are very closeted um, or very, very quiet about what they do and how they do it. And so members only prevents, you know, strangers from just wandering in uh, we're able to monitor um, uh, members coming and going. We're able to provide uh, security and what have you at a different level than if you simply have a business that is open to anybody and everybody that walks in. You know, look at it like a health club. You know, you join a health club, and if you don't belong to the health club, you can't get in past the desk, you know, it's as far as you get. Well, basically, that's all it would amount to. Uh, there would be a small annual membership, but we're looking at it being very nominal, um, probably under $100 annually, okay? And we're looking at having pool tables and uh, video games we're planning on hopefully having. Uh, there will be internet available for people. We're going to have some lounge areas um, where folks can sit and visit and make new friends and visit with old friends. And there will be internet access available. Um, and then also, um, we hope to have the equivalent to a um, kind of like an internet cafe. We're going to have an area where you'd be able to go, and if you don't have a laptop or a computer to use, uh, then we're going to have several that you'd be able to um, book time on, and you'd be able to use our computers and uh, some other things. But again, I'm not going to get into too much detail. Um, we hope to have, uh, as part of the facility, an area where we would be able to host uh, events like karaoke nights, um, possibly even some drag shows. And uh, I personally have no qualms with drag at all. Um, quite frankly, talking plainly over the years, I've actually dated people over the years who performed in drag. And um, for those foolish people who think that, you know, everybody who dresses in drag uh, has some penchant, you know, wanting to be a woman. I got news for you. That is not true. A lot of people who do drag, it's just fun for them. You know, they put on a character, they perform in character, and then the minute they come off the stage, they're just as happy to take it off. You know, it, it's not at all a lifestyle or anything of that nature. It's just fun, you know. And as someone who had a clown ministry as a young man, I kind of understand it. You say you're comparing drag to clowning. Yes, in a lot of ways, it's very similar. You get made up, you costume, you become a different character. And, and when you're in that other character, you're able to act out differently than you do in the real world. And, you know, and it's a lot of fun. So anyway... So uh, we're looking at possibly also the club would be able to have some activities maybe on uh, Saturdays uh, morning, early afternoon that are geared for children. So members would actually be able to bring their kids to the club and we would have some special um, movie programs or, you know, um, video programs and what have you. Um, uh, it, I can't describe it all to you. It's rather complex. Uh, but there was a, a club, a small club in New York City 
years ago that I went to when I, this is during my time out of church, and uh, they had video uh, monitors all around the, the various areas of the club. And they would, of course, you know, for the most part, they'd have uh, music videos playing, you know. And uh, then they would intersperse that with some comedic videos. And they'd have uh, 10 minutes or so of Will and Grace or 10 minutes or so of um, Golden Girls, you know. And then they'd go back to music videos. And then every so often they would intersperse it with comedy and all this. And that place used to be a blast. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed being there. Um, it was just a nice place to hang out with friends or to go alone. And, um, you know, uh, it was just a fun place to be. And in some ways, I'm kind of building off of that concept. To do this is going to take lots and lots and lots and lots of time, effort, and money. And uh, I think that a place like this, Huntsville has no uh, bars or clubs for, that are specific to LGBT people. So I think that a place like this could really be a boon for this area. It would be, hate to tell you folks, it would be non-alcoholic. I'm not interested in owning a bar, okay, to be honest with you. Also, even if I were interested in owning a bar, which I'm not, um, you get into a whole nother set of legalities and, um, you know, and uh, um, <sighs> you become liable, you know, insurance wise and stuff and for a whole nother set of things. So anyway, so it'll be a non-alcoholic setting, but um, I think it would still be a place that a lot of members of our community would enjoy belonging to. There'd be something going on, you know, a few nights a week that folks might be interested in coming out and participating in, or if you just want to not be home. You know, one of my little slogans that I've already, um, that I've already toyed with is, you know, why sit home alone when you can come out to the club, you know, and connect with folks. So uh, that's kind of the idea that we have going. But again, if I had church folks even that could maybe help me with this project, that would, you know, be another uh, boon for us. That could really help us. I, I've got to get accustomed to sitting in Tommy's seat, uh, his chair in the office. I'm on wheels. So if I'm not careful, I'm going to go flying, you know. All right, we are in the middle of our LGBT affirming Bible study. As I've said last week, the video from last Wednesday is already up to 330 views. That is just wonderful. We're going to continue this, uh, this study tonight. Uh, we were looking last week at uh, the biblical case for same-sex uh, relationships. And um, before we go any further, we want to stop and uh, seek the Lord in prayer. So if you'll bow your heads with me. Master, we love you, God, today, and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come together to explore the Word of God. What a privilege and an honor it is to live in a country where we're free to explore the sacred text. Master, in the name of Jesus, we lift up my mother today. We ask God that you would touch her and help her. You know the need. You know what's going on. And Lord, today, in the name of Jesus, we put her in your hands and ask you, God, to intervene on her behalf. Master, as we continue this study tonight, I ask, Lord, that you would open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds. Help us to be receptive to the truth of God, for liberty and deliverance are available to those who seek the truth. Not tradition, not man-made doctrine, not merely towing the line, but those who seek 
the truth, for you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Master, tonight anoint your teacher, anoint every ear that hears. Allow us, O oh God, today to have hearts that are cultivated by the Holy Ghost, ready, able, and willing to receive from your word by your spirit. For we ask it tonight in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Last week, I was talking about the fact that uh, I approach this subject matter a little different, a lot differently, perhaps, than many people do. There are many LGBT affirming um, theologians, and by the way, not all LGBT affirming theologians are LGBT. There are many who uh, have searched the scriptures and done their research and uh, searched things out who are not part of the LGBT community, but they are allies and they're supported. Um, some of the books that are out there, you know, Mel White, uh, of course, is part of the community. But Bishop Sponge was one of the earliest writers. He was an Episcopal bishop. Um, he is not part of the LGBT community, but he uh, was an early advocate for LGBT affirming theology. Um, many of them, you know, they they look at and explore and re-examine the passages that uh, are commonly used according to, you know, uh, many in the church world. These passages are used to bash LGBT people, you know. And it's good to examine those passages because there is, in fact, a lot of misunderstanding and misrepresentation, misinterpretation of those passages. However, um, because this ministry approaches things theologically the way we do, and one of my favorite phrases you constantly hear me say, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Uh, this is how the Word of God says that the Lord imparts His truth unto His people. And uh, you have to rightly divide. The Apostle Paul said, Study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So it's important that we approach this from kind of a very well-rounded perspective. We've looked at, not only have we looked at passages within the Law of Moses that are commonly used against LGBT people, but we looked even broader. We looked at what was the purpose of the law, for whom was the law written, how was the law applied, and how were those rules applied. Um, these are all important things to understand if you're going to have a really well-balanced uh, understanding of LGBT affirming theology, at least from where this preacher sits. That's how I feel about it. Um, when I talk about scripture and, and um, same-sex relationships, um, I could, if I wanted to, try to make a case for uh, some instances there being sexual um, relationships involved. Uh, quite frankly, in the case of David and Jonathan, there, there's some pretty healthy suggestion that that's possible. And honestly, David, being the lover of women that he was, um, it, it, it wouldn't altogether be a hard stretch for him to be bisexual at the very least. Um, one thing that I've talked about in recent weeks that people really need to understand, um, ancient attitudes toward human sexuality and marriage, those two issues, um, were very different than the attitudes we have today. 
And anybody who comes at you and says to you, well, marriage has always been, they're an idiot, okay? I'm going to say it as plain as I can say it. You have to be a blooming, ignorant idiot to make that phrase, to say that. You, you just have to be as dumb as a brick. Nothing, nothing is as it's always been. There is no such thing as anything being consistent throughout history and throughout the ages. Secondly, when you look at these issues, both marriage and human sexuality, from uh, society to society, from culture to culture, you find that attitudes were different, beliefs were different, the way they approached things were different. So to suggest that American view, you know, the religious rights view of human sexuality and marriage is the same view held around the world is, again, an idiotic statement to make because it is not. No, in other countries, other cultures, they approach sexuality, they approach marriage very differently. Um, I've been doing some research as of late, and I'll share some couple of books with you that I am referring to. Um, there was a gentleman back in the 1970s who was a, uh, he had been born and raised Episcopalian. He converted to Roman Catholicism, which, you know, um, that, that wasn't much of a difference, really, you know, except for the papacy, obviously. But anyway, uh, by the name of John Boswell. And John Boswell was a brilliant human being. Uh, he was a college professor in an Ivy League school. He uh, was both um, a historian and an expert in a number, a number of languages, both um, old and current. Um, he believed that when he studied various cultures and various um, places and their views on things, he believed that the best way to understand what they uh, believed and how they felt, uh, it required that he know the language. Because as he says in his writings, you know, he says, you can't even begin to understand how severely translation affects um, what is being said. He said, you know, um, because oftentimes in, in our language, there is nothing equivalent to what the other language is saying. So we have to either create a phrase or coin a phrase or, or we have to somehow try to compensate for that. And a lot of times... Uh, they do, frankly, a rather poor job of that. For instance, in many other cultures, when they, uh, when they refer to love, for instance, love is not the same. The, the terms that they use for love, uh, we use love for everything from I love my cat, I love my husband, I love my house, I love my car, I love my suit, you know, I love my mother. And yet in other languages, they actually have specific terms relative to each of these various relationships and to the object of your affection, okay? And uh, so uh, yet in English, we just kind of use the all-encompassing word love, you know. And so anyway, John Boswell wrote a couple of um they're, they're considered to be some of the best treaties on the subjects uh, known to man. One of them being same-sex unions in pre-modern Europe. I'm going to show it to you there. Now I'm going to warn you, if, if you want to run out and buy these books, you can get it on Amazon. They are written, honestly, very much at a college level. 
um, they're, they, they really take, you, you've got to read it and kind of take some time, unless you're a whole lot smarter than I am. Uh, you have to take your time reading it. To be honest, I kind of have to read a chapter and then I'll stop and I'll think about it for a while, you know, because it's very, very highbrow. You know, it's a, it is very scholastic. It is collegiate. You know, it's very, these books are used in colleges as textbooks, okay? And then there is another book that he wrote that I have here which is Christianity, Social Tolerance, and Homosexuality. Let me fix it up there. There you go. Now, uh, John Boswell has provided a lot of great information that I have really appreciated learning. Um, you know, the attitudes towards same-sex relationships, going back into antiquity, um, was so different than what we see in America today. I mean, it was just completely the opposite. You know, they didn't have any problem with it. They didn't see anything wrong with it. It was not a big issue to them, okay? And um, there are many cultures that had that view. Even modern cultures, when I say modern, I mean coming up into the 17, 18, and 1900s, and that includes many of your North American um, uh, Native American tribes and what have you. Many of them, they had very open views on human sexuality and same-sex sexuality. Okay, so um, it's really important to understand this because, again, when we read certain things in especially in the old testament but you got to remember the new testament is still 2000 years old that's old things were very different then uh, john boswell talks about the fact that even within the earliest uh, days of the roman catholic institution uh, or organization um there, there was not a real animus toward LGBT issues or LGBT people until like the 12th century. That's a long time. That's over a thousand years uh, between the establishment of the church and, uh, and a time when they began to kind of develop these more negative views. And of course, a lot of that had to do with the development of um, this whole theology, marriage as a sacrament, marriage as uh, the primary purpose of marriage is supposed to be procreation and blah, blah, blah. Well, I've got news for you today. Um, a, that is not the view held by many cultures and many people around the world. Uh, and uh, now, of course, in, mod in, the, in the modern world, for instance, the attitude that we have in America is that marriage is first and foremost based on love. You know, people fall in love and they get married and marriage is about love. Um, that attitude and that belief system is a very recent development. I remember my grandmother telling me some years ago, uh, many years ago, she told me, she said, in my day, now this is just my grandmother, two generations past. She, she married my grandfather right after World War II. Um, she said, in my day, she said, CJ, things were different, you know. She said... Yeah, you know, men were, were, mostly men, it was about them being attracted to the woman. Because the the first thing with a man is always going to be, you know, the sexual element, you know, the attraction element. She said, but for women, it wasn't always about looks. And it wasn't always about uh, how attracted to them sexually you were. She said, we tended to look at men. Now, of course, my grandmother was Portuguese. 
So she's also speaking from a Portuguese cultural perspective. She said, we looked at men in terms of, is this a good, sound, hardworking man? I'll tell you, the Portuguese, oh, sweetie, they put the highest priority, the highest level of importance on a human being uh, in, in line with their um, uh, work ethic and their desire to work, okay? Um, everything in Portuguese culture, the first question they'll ask you, when my grandmother met somebody, the first question she asks is, uh, what do you do, you know? And it didn't matter to her if you said, I work at McDonald's. Didn't matter to her if you said, I installed telephone poles. Didn't matter to her if you said, I'm the vice president of, of the World Bank. You know, it, it, honestly, that didn't matter to her near as much as some of the follow-up questions she's going to ask. Then she's going to ask, oh, and how long have you been there? You know? And it's all about stability. It's all about your ability to have a job and hold a job and provide for your family. And my grandmother said to me, honestly said to me, she said, when I met your grandfather, she said, to be honest with you, I thought he was the homeliest man I ever met in my life. She said, I did not think physically, I did not find him very attractive. My grandfather, thank the Lord, has passed on, so I can say this, uh, albeit with great affection, because I adored my grandfather, my mother's dad. He was not <laughs> the best-looking man. Even in his younger days, he was not altogether a good-looking fellow. Um, but my grandmother said, that isn't what attracted me to him. What attracted me to him was, this guy had ambition. This guy had an amazing work ethic. So, oh my God, you never saw anybody that worked as hard as this man worked. She said, and in my little Portuguese mind, boy, that just was like a magnet to metal, you know. That attracted me to him. And um, many cultures, many people over the centuries, they married for a number of reasons beyond love. They had nothing to do with love. Why do you think in the scriptures God continually uh, through his prophets and through the writers talks about husbands loving their wives and wives loving their husbands? Why do you think he literally through the New Testament writers issues the command, husbands love your wives? Think about it for a second. If Marriage has always been about love, you know. Well, then wouldn't that kind of, that be assumed that the husband would love the wife and the wife would love the husband? But you see, historically, it is, marriage has not always been about love. That is a very new thing, all right? So therefore, what often happened in ancient times coming right up through World War II, as my grandmother said. She said, you would marry somebody because you admired them, you respected them, you saw them as being stable and a good provider. You saw them as being someone who um, could uh, provide you with children and, you know, a family. And she said, and then in the course of your living together and, and pursuing life together, she said, then you fell in love with them over the course of time. You grew to love them, okay? And um, so this was very common in bygone eras. And for that reason, I believe the apostles wrote such commands as, you know, husbands love your wives. It was like, you need to make a conscious choice to love your spouse because love was not necessarily the reason you married them, okay? And so attitudes in the ancient world were very different. I'm saying all this, I'm laying all this groundwork because as we look at some of these things, you need to understand this, okay? We talked last week about Ruth and Naomi. 
uh, I referred to the fact that um, the relationship between them was so strong and the bond between them was so great that Ruth refused to return to her own family, to her own people. She refused, in essence, to move on with her life after her husband, Naomi's son, had died. Her sister-in-law, when her husband died, Naomi's other son, she did eventually go back to her family and moved on with her life. But Ruth looked at her mother-in-law and said, no, I'm not going to leave you. Don't even ask me to leave you. Wherever you live, that's where I'm going to live. Whatever God you serve, that's the God I'm going to serve. And where you die, that's where I'm going to die. She literally made <clears throat> what amounts to a till death do us part vow to her mother-in-law, Naomi. And people say, well, but that's not a homosexual relationship. Um, listen. I get sick and tired of people who walk in ignorance thinking that homosexuality, by reason of the title that it's been given, is all about sexuality to begin with. It is not all about sexuality. There are in a number of other factors that come into play. So when we're looking at marriage and when we're looking at relationships, to look at it as though sexuality is the primary driver is just sheer stupidity to my thinking, okay? I'm not buying into that. That No, no. I told you I have a great aunt and uncle. Uh, they married, again, right after World War II, and uh, they had their children. I believe it was four or five, and uh, immediately after that, um, my aunt, anyway, from what I understand, had the mentality that uh, intimacy was strictly for the purpose of procreation. And once you were no longer interested in procreating, you stopped having intimacy. Now, that's an insane notion for many of us, okay? But this is how she approached things, and from what I understand... My uncle went along with her. You know, I know he loved her. He gave her a marvelous life. Uh, they did very, very well together. He, you know, he made a great deal of money and uh, became very successful in life. And they had a wonderful life together. Uh, many of us here and that are thinking to ourselves, what was she insane? You know, that's crazy. Uh, but that's the way they did it. And while they were married for by the time he died, they were married, my goodness, over 60 years. Um, they literally, literally lived uh, about 50 of those years with, with no physical sexual interaction. Okay? Who's to sit in judgment of that? Not me. It's none of my business. Uh, I, ha I have no business poking into other people's private affairs, and you have no business poking into my affairs, okay? So, uh, I approach things very different, okay? I'm looking at the simple fact of, is it possible for two human beings of the same gender to have such love and devotion one for another that they desire to establish and build a life together. That is what I'm looking at, okay? Because to my mind, that is what marriage is about. The sexuality aspect of it falls way down the line. That That's hardly the first thing on the list, okay? Uh, but, you know, we, I mentioned last week, we live in a sex-obsessed society, the church is sex-obsessed. You know, my God, every other thought in their mind has to do with sex. And uh, they think God has nothing better to do than sit around monitoring bedrooms. And that, you know, his first concern is what you do in private 
uh, between you and another consenting adult. And when I say anything even remotely contrary to that, oh my Lord, have mercy, do the, do their, does their ire flare up, okay? God forbid you suggest anything different. Um, well, you know, if God is so sex-obsessed, if he is so concerned with what goes on in private between two consenting individuals, why in the world is it we don't see him judging David? Why in the world do we not see him judging Abraham? Why do we not see him judging Jacob? Jacob had two wives and two concubines, four wives in total, as in essence, uh, that he wound up having children with. And those four women uh, were the source of the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, don't give me this crap that, that marriage has always been between one man and one woman. Uh, you, those people who tell you that foolishness are being so biblically and intellectually dishonest that they really need somebody to slap them upside the head because it's crap. It is pure garbage. We would not have the 12 tribes of Israel were it not for four women. Okay? Okay. We would not have the Arab world and the Jewish world were it not for two women, one man, two women. Um, David killed. He sent a man out to war. He sent him out to the front lines knowing he was likely to be killed so that he could free up the man's wife for himself. We don't see God striking David dead. We don't see God, you know, even coming to David and rebuking him for this. You know, there is constant, there is a constant stream of sexual immorality and ill behavior throughout the entire Old Testament. I, I, I could go down the list and... You know, it, it, I'd be here all month talking about Lot and his daughters and, you know, all of this, okay? There's a constant stream of sexual immorality. And yet what we don't see is God constantly judging, condemning, and, you know, having any kind of a response or reaction to all this sexual activity that's going on that is outside of the bounds of normalcy, that is outside of the bounds of morality, that in, in all honesty is outside of the bounds even of the Old Testament law of Moses. Even activity outside of the law, we don't see him condemning. Okay. Does that mean he condoned? I am not suggesting for a moment that the Lord condoned that. I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is, why in the world, if this is God's highest priority, if this is the Lord's first and foremost concern in the world, why do we not see him having much more frequent responses and reactions, judgments, criticism, condemnation? Then in the New Testament, we have God walking planet earth as a man he encounters people with all kinds of sexual issues many of which are outside of the bounds of uh, the law of Moses the word of God said he ate with publicans and sinners we know that he was known to uh, socialize as it were with prostitutes uh, with people who engaged in uh, illicit sexual conduct. He sat at the well, Jacob's well, with a woman who had been married several times. And now the, the man that she was living with, she wasn't even married to. Never, ever, ever in the entire New Testament 
do we see Jesus addressing any sexual misconduct? Why don't we see him rebuking these people? Why don't we see? We're supposed to be Christ-like, and yet, like the Lord said, he said, a servant cannot be above his master. The best he can hope to do is to be as his master. And yet, we see Christians trying to act as though somehow they're greater than Jesus so that they can sit in judgment of others uh, for that which they do in private and that which they do related to physical intimacy. The Lord never did it, but they can. Bless God, I can do it. I'm going to tell you something, honey. I wouldn't want to be you on the judgment day. Mm -mm. Oh, oh, would not want to be you for a million dollars. Because the word of God promises you will be judged by the same measure with which you have judged. So the same cruelty, the same uh, legalism, the same uh, malice that you exercise in judging others, the Lord is going to turn that mess right around on you. And you're going to get at both barrels. And those of you who are part of the uh, fundamentalist and evangelical community who love to say, oh, I believe the whole Bible, and I, I've said it so many times, honestly, I get tired of saying it, uh, but you're a liar and you're a fraud. You're a fake. You don't believe the whole Bible for nothing in the world. You are full of baloney. If you believe the whole Bible, you would live a life free of judgment and condemnation because Jesus himself told us Judge not, and you'll not be judged. Condemn not, and you'll not be condemned. Oh, but somehow you feel comfortable judging and condemning. You don't have any problem with that whatsoever. And so obviously you don't believe the whole Bible. Obviously. Because you're bringing a, a heap of hell down on your head like you can't even imagine. And you're trying to tell me you believe the Bible? No, you don't. You don't. You believe what you want to believe. You toss out the window everything you don't want to believe. And you're very selective. And that is a dangerous place to be. So last week we talked about Ruth and Naomi. Uh, Ruth made a vow to Naomi that was a till death do us part vow. If you read the words that uh, Ruth used, it literally reads like a wedding vow. Um, this was important when you take into account that having a man was extremely important at that time in human history. If you notice, Naomi even said to Ruth something to the effect of, um, well, actually, I've got it right here. But she said to her, uh, I want to see if I can. Yeah, there, there we go. Verse 13. Naomi asks Ruth, Would ye tarry for them? Meaning if she were to have sons, would you tarry for them? Till they were grown, would she stay for them from having husbands? You know, would you abstain from having a husband until they were old enough for you to marry? She said, Nay, my daughters. Now listen, for it grieveth me much for your sakes, that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. So what Naomi is literally saying is, the fact that I have no husband, the fact that I have no man in my life, is the equivalent to God punishing me. You know, it's like God somehow or another is acting against me. Because... It was common in the ancient world for women and uh, orphaned children to starve to death. If they had no family, they had no husband, if they had no males um, that were able to sustain them and support them, they would literally starve to death in the streets. 
they'd have to go to begging and, you know, taking in laundry and trying to do whatever they could do to make money to survive. And, uh, and there were many things back at that time that women couldn't do, you know. It wasn't like they could just go out, quote-unquote, and get a job. No, 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 no. Because, uh, for instance, let's say Naomi decided, well, I'll just go get, I like to fish. I'll go get a job as a fisherman. No, not going to happen. They didn't hire women. Women were not employed in all of these lines of work. So, you know, Naomi is saying to her, uh, my situation is bad enough, but, you know, God has relocated me to having no man. I have nobody to provide for me. The last thing in the world you need to do is attach yourself to me. And yet, Ruth turns around and says, no, no, I love you. I want to, I'm committed to you. I want to be with you. I want to stay with you. And your your plight, in essence, will be my plight. If you starve to death, then we'll starve to get to death together, okay? And so you see this beautiful dynamic. You see this wonderful commitment uh, between these women. And got news for you. That same dynamic is very much present in many, if not most, LGBT relationships, folks. A lot of people who watch this, you're not LGBT. Matter of fact, you're vehemently against LGBT people. Well, unlike you, I know thousands, not hundreds, not dozens, thousands of LGBT people. I know couples that have been together 50 years. I know couples have been together 30 and 40 years. Tommy and I have been together 22 years and counting. Um, my mother has said, you know, I've got three sons, and she said, and the one son that has the healthiest, uh, most sustained relationship is my gay son. Um, my other brothers have been married and divorced at least once since Tommy and I have been together, and uh, they were married and divorced before that. So, but they, but, you know, one of them's been married and divorced a couple of times since Tommy and I have been together. Um, but, you know, uh, that commitment, that love, that devotion, you know, is very much an element in many, 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 many LGBT, affirm, uh, many LGBT relationships, okay? And uh, there is something to be said for that. You can, you know, uh, those who try to put down gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual people, they love to um, just discount any value in our relationships. You know, one thing that kind of tickles me, uh, the people here in Alabama are friendly. They're very sweet. Um, if they dislike you or hate you or are homophobic or whatever, they generally don't manifest it in public anyway, you know, to your face. They're very nice. You know, I tell people at restaurants and stuff all the time that Tommy and I have been together for 22 years, you know, and most of the time the reaction, oh, congratulations, you know, and that's nice because at least they acknowledge that there is, in fact, value. They're, you know, they're, um, the, the same way you would appreciate the longevity of a of a um, heterosexual relationship, they appreciate the longevity of our relationship. And, uh, but the opponents of LGBT people, they just dismiss it. Like that means nothing. And it always makes me laugh. And I tell people all the time, if you try to build a relationship on sexual attraction and sexual com uh, compatibility and what have you, um, it's going to be a very, very short-lived relationship. I've seen it over the years many, many times. People who, you know, especially young people where they're all caught up in looks and, you know, everything's about looks and, and sexual attraction, you know, and they're all caught up in that. And uh, you try to build a relationship on that. 
And honey, it, it don't work. It doesn't last very long. I actually, um, over the years, I actually dated some people who I was very attracted to. And, and from a physical aspect, you know, they were beautiful people. They were, they you know, I'm not going to go into great detail. Tommy's sitting here. I'll, all of a sudden, you'll see a hand coming out from the sidelines whacking me. But, you know, um, the sexual attraction aspect of things was high. But I still said to them, I'm sorry, but um, we really shouldn't be trying to pursue anything, you know, because there were any number of other areas where things just were not meshing. And, um, and I'm not dumb enough to try to build a relationship strictly on physical attraction. There's no way in the world. Some people that I've met over the years, honestly, they were just too immature. They were too naive, you know. Um, their intellect wasn't quite where I needed it to be for, to enjoy being with somebody. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of, of aspects. Um so Ruth and Naomi have this incredible commitment to one another, Naomi to, to Ruth in particular, and it simply demonstrates absolutely that two people of the same gender can have a strong, lasting, lifetime even, level of love and commitment one to another. All right? Uh, there, nothing in the world, nothing in scripture suggests otherwise. Now I want to point out to you one of the primary falsehoods in anti-LGBT theology, primarily from the fundamentalist and the evangelical camp, as well as other traditions as well, uh, comes f this false notion that God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Because after all, from minute one, God created Eve for the purpose of procreation. Um, no, that's not quite what Scripture says. What does Scripture say? Genesis 2, 15 through 18. And the Lord took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. Right there, we are able to see exactly why God created Eve. And it's funny for those who claim it's all about procreation. Why did God, who knows everything, he knows the end from the beginning. He knew when he first created Adam that he was going to create Eve. Why did he not create them together from word go? Because after all, it's all about procreation from minute one. Why did he not create Eve from minute one? Well, could it be because of what we just read? He wanted to clearly define what Eve's initial purpose was. Two things the Lord said. First of all, he said, it is not good that man should be alone. So in that statement, we read, that Eve was created for companionship. Secondly, he said, I will create a helpmeet for him. So she was created to be a companion one and to assist him too. 
Okay? Procreation is not part of the mix here. I don't see God saying, I will create for him a, a companion, a help me to one with whom he can procreate and, you know, create little atoms and little eaves to run around. No. Procreation is not even mentioned. Why? I believe because God does everything God does legitimately for a very specific purpose. There's, there is no, there are no mistakes, honey, in the Word of God. If the Lord presents it to us in this fashion, He has some divine reasoning for doing this. Why did He do it? Well, because I want people to understand what my initial plan for coupling was. Now I'm going to really blow your minds, those of you uh, from the. It's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve camp. It could have been Adam and Steve. If God created Eve to be a companion and a help, it could easily have been an Adam and Steve situation. Why did the Lord create Eve somewhat different from Adam? Well, part of it is because he took from Adam certain elements in creating Eve. Now, I believe not only from a physical perspective, but I think there, there's a lot of spiritual significance here. If you look at Hebrew teaching and Hebrew tradition, the Hebrew faith teaches that Adam was, in effect, um, created male and female. That's literally what Jewish teaching teaches, that Adam was created with both aspects, both male and female attributes, as it were. And that what God did is God extracted the female aspect and the female attributes to create uh, a second person so that they would not clash or, or, or contradict one another, conflict with one another, but rather that they would mesh. This is the idea that um, the man shall leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Because now in the two, you get um, the best of both aspects. You get the nurturing, you get the caring, you know, uh, and at the same time, you get the protective and you get, you know, uh, the attributes that are generally ascribed to the male. And so, matter of fact, in, in Jewish tradition, they literally paint uh, Adam as having two faces. A male and female face, one, uh, you know, on either side of his head. So it's really interesting when you look at the history and the background of some of these things. So Eve was not created for procreation. First of all, folks, again, this is what I mean about how people study the Bible, but they, they don't use their head for much more than ornamentation on top of their neck. What purpose would there have been in the Lord creating Adam and Eve for procreation purposes when initially Adam and Eve were confined to the Garden of Eden? They were there to, to tend the garden, to care for the garden. They also, according to Scripture, were initially designed to never die. If they're confined to a certain area, which we know was honestly just a couple of square miles is what the Word of God basically describes. The Garden of Eden was not a humongous, gigantic area. Um... If they were confined to this space and God said, okay, now make babies, wouldn't be too long before they'd have overpopulated that area 
And they, you know, they'd have themselves a little New York City with 10,000 people per square mile, okay? So, the reality is, the Word of God says that Adam and Eve, God breathed into Adam's nostrils, and Adam became a living soul. This is something that I've believed and I've taught for many years. I'm going to, I'm going to curl some people's hair because God forbid you say anything they're not accustomed to hearing. God forbid you say anything that is new or different, you know. And I always say, is this a heaven or hell issue? No. Nope. Do you have to believe this? Nope. Can you be part of our church and not believe this? Yep. Because it's, it's, it's not a big enough issue. I don't think that it matters, okay? But I absolutely believe, according to the Word of God, we started out in a certain state of existence. Adam was created in a certain state of existence. And as you travel through the entirety of God's Word, it makes one enormous circle, and it comes right back around again. We come to the point where Adam falls and disobeys. Then we come to the cross. Jesus provides the way of salvation. Then we come eventually to the rapture. We come to the um, resurrection, and we are changed, and we are once again, once again made in his likeness and in his image. Word of God said, we shall be like him. Well, who is he? He is the physical incarnation of God. We're going to become like God, who had been a man. What that man figure that God, you know, became, what he became after the ascension. What did he become? He became the same thing that Adam had started out as. Okay, he was created in the likeness of God. Adam was created a living soul. I do not believe Adam had a physical flesh and blood body at creation. Nope, nope not at all. A living soul does not denote that he had a physical flesh and blood body. I believe he and Eve were relegated to a physical flesh and blood body at the moment they disobeyed and partook of the tree of life, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, at that point, their nature was demoted. And this then is why they suddenly tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. See, without a physical body, they had no need to do that. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul uses the term naked in referring to being outside of your body. He literally refers to being naked. He said, unless being found naked, meaning outside of our body. Okay? And we're going to take on a new body after the resurrection. And the way Paul describes it is, we are clothed with that new body. So Adam and Eve in the garden were initially clothed with a spiritual body, but not a natural body. When they disobeyed the Lord, all of a sudden they looked and said, uh-oh, the minute God looks at us, he's going to know something's changed. He's going to know we did what we ought not to have done. Do you follow what I'm trying to say? And this is why the, the word of God said, the Lord said, well, who told you you're naked? Who told you you don't have any clothes? You, you, do you follow? All right. Now, some people say, well, I don't believe that, but God, God told them to be fruitful and multiply right from day one. Glory to Jesus. Well, first of all, the book of Genesis is not written in perfect chronological order. We know that because in the first chapter we read God creating everything. You know, the seven days of creation creates man, he creates woman. Then the second chapter, all of a sudden, we're going right back to God creating man and eventually creating woman, so on and so forth. Um, Moses was writing from a prophetic position, meaning he was writing as God revealed to him, as God showed him, okay? And 
Uh, he did not write, even as John in the book of Revelation does not write everything in perfect chronological order. Anyone who's studied Revelation can tell you many of the things John speaks of here are going to happen after this, and things he speaks of there are going to happen before this. You know, it's not written. Prophetic writings are not altogether written in perfect chronological order. We read of the Lord telling Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, however... When this is spoken to them, we don't see that they obey. We do not see they immediately went out and started to have children. As a matter of fact, guess when they began to procreate? After the fall, after they were expelled from the garden. Why does that make perfect sense? Well, it's easy, because prior to their fall, there was no need for procreation. What need is there? Of two beings, God created Eve to be a helpmate and to be a companion. What need is there for them to procreate? There is none. The whole reason he created Eve was to be for Adam what he needed. Okay, And the two of them could successfully have lived in the garden for all of eternity. Okay? But then there's another interesting little point. Again, I'm talking about line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Rightly dividing the word of God. We also read the Lord Jesus Christ when some of the uh, scribes and Pharisees come to him and tempt him. And they try to, uh, you know, throw him a curveball. And they say, well, what about this woman? You know, she's married to a man and he dies, but she hasn't had any children to carry on his name. So then his his brother steps up like the law asks him to do and marries her, you know, but he dies and they still haven't had. And then he dies and they still haven't had another brother and another brother. This woman must just love that family because she married all these men in the same family, all these brothers. And they said, you know, after the resurrection... Whose wife is she going to be? And what did the Lord respond? He said, after the resurrection, he said, no. He said, they'll be as the angels. He said, they're neither married nor given in marriage. See, the whole concept of coupling for the purpose of procreation and family, all of that is post-fall. It all became necessary because of the fall. Guess what else became necessary because of the fall? Sexuality, period. Okay? Sexuality became necessary after the fall. If we started out as living souls, if we started out in the same state as we're eventually going to wind up back at, Jesus said, you're neither married nor given in marriage. And I tell the truth. I know I am. So therefore, that suggests to me that after the resurrection, we are in effect asexual. Okay? So, this being true, um, coupling and coming together for the purposes of procreation was an absolute necessity demanded by humankind's fall. This is why when we read the list of, of things that people in fundamentalist and evangelical camps, they love to point to it as um, God is like cursing Eve, you know, and cursing Adam. Now, when you work the fields, you're going to work by the sweat of your brow. You're going to know what it is to prick your finger on thorns, and you're going to know, you know, what it what it is to feel muscle pains and aches and, and wounds and bruises, and the woman you're going to uh, hurt in childbirth. That was not a punishment by any stretch of the imagination. That wasn't God cursing them. No, the Lord was letting them know, folks, this now is what you've opened yourself up to by disobeying me. I told you that the same day that you disobeyed and ate of that one particular tree, you had all kinds of 
plants to eat from, and I asked you to leave one alone. And I told you that day you eat of that one singular tree, listen, death will become a reality for you. It's going to become an absolute reality for you. Prior to that, death was unheard of. Death was nowhere on the horizon. How long did Adam and Eve walk as living souls on the face of planet Earth before they disobeyed God? We have no idea. The Bible doesn't tell us. Could it have been millions and millions of years? Potentially. Could there have been dinosaurs roaming the earth outside of the garden that Adam and Eve never saw? Possibly. Could it be that science and faith aren't as far removed as we think they are? Mm, possibly. But you see, every time we want to assume that we know all the facts and we have all the information and the way we look at it is the absolute right way to look at it. This is what I said when I say, if it weren't for hypocrisy, fundamentalism would not exist, okay? When you put yourself in a box, when you apply all these absolutes, and nowhere in the equation are you ever able to accept, well, maybe we were a little bit wrong. Maybe we misunderstood this. Maybe we didn't quite read this right. I've pointed out the fact to people. Um, I've pointed out in the past, you know, um, I have a very, because of what I'm talking about right now, I have a very different view when science talks about Earth being, you know, millions and billions of years old and blah, blah. And therefore, this proves the Bible is wrong. No, it doesn't, doesn't prove the Bible's wrong at all. It may prove we've misread it, but it doesn't prove the Bible's wrong. My Bible says, listen carefully. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. The seven days of creation are not beginning at, quote-unquote, the Big Bang. No, mm -mm. the Bible doesn't say that. See, we look at, uh, you know, we look at, and God said, let there be light. And boy, that's when everything started. No, 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 no. The word of God tells us differently, folks. My God, this isn't hard. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. Then he said, let there be light. So did God create everything in seven days? Nope. Not at all. Did he pull creation together and cause it to be this working biological uh, planet in seven days? Yes. And I do believe that. How long? How long between the Lord creating the heavens and the earth? It's what it says. For God's sakes, my heavens, this isn't hard to get. How long between him creating the heavens and the earth in the unshapen state, okay? In the unstructured, un unshaped state, as it were. 
How long were the raw materials existent before the Lord said, let there be light? Then, think about this, how long does it take the light of the sun to reach the earth? It takes a very long time. So before the first day could even transpire, there were years and eons that had to pass because God created the heavens, he created the earth. He said, let there be light, poof, we got light. When he, or excuse me, when he creates the sun and the stars, when he creates the sun, how long does it take the light? You can't have a day until after that light has reached the earth. He's already created the heavens and the earth, and the earth is without form and void. So we know that the earth in an undeveloped state exists. Say, Pastor, why are you saying this? Because, folks, if you understand this, then you understand that maybe the people who are telling you that these rocks are eight, 85 million years old, maybe they're right. Maybe your little asinine notion that from minute one of creation till today has been 6,000 years. No, 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 no. You, you started your countdown at an altogether wrong time. And they go by the lifespan of various characters in scripture, you know, to do the math. Um, how long did Adam and Eve walk the earth as living souls living souls guess what living souls don't do living souls do not require housing living souls do not require dishes living souls do not require building fires living souls do not leave footprints physical footprints therefore Adam and Eve could have existed on the earth for millions and millions or a billion years for all we know before they disobeyed God. When you, when you count someone's lifespan, you only count a lifespan based upon the reality of extinction or the, the reality of death. Therefore, would Adam's age be listed in Scripture based on from the minute he was created and so many years he died? No. <laughs> no, you don't do a countdown when death isn't even a possibility. That, that's not how you do it, folks. That's not how it works. That countdown would have begun, listen carefully now, I know, I know I'm blowing a lot of people's minds, but that's okay. To me, it's exciting. I think this is really exciting stuff to think about. The Word of God said, you must be born again. Guess what happened in the garden when Adam and Eve disobeyed God? They were born again but not in the positive direction, but in the negative, okay? They were born again. They took on a whole new life. They took on a whole new existence. That is when the clock began to tick. That is when you would begin to measure their age. That is when you would begin to measure their years. So as living souls, they may have been on this planet for God knows how long. The earth in its undeveloped state may have been here for billions of years. The raw materials, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. Minerally, okay, substantively, the elements of earth, you know, I love the concept of the Big Bang Theory, because all these 
gases and elements had to exist, where did they come from? See, they don't answer that. They don't try to answer that. They don't, well, they, they just must have been here. Well, how'd they get here? Where did they come from? Come on, scientists, you're so smart, you know everything. How did all these gases and all these elements, where did they come from? See, my Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was out form and void. Darkness covered the face of the deep. So that tells me that what God first did was he created the raw materials. But what it doesn't say is that he immediately began to form and he immediately began to speak the various elements into existence. Okay. That is an assumption that we make in reading the book. But I'm smart enough to know that God doesn't tell mere mortals every single detail of everything, or else the Bible would be, the Word of God said if everything were to be written of Jesus, the apostle said that the, vol the world couldn't contain the volumes, that's of Jesus. Just imagine then, what makes you think that God is going to give us every bit of information we need to know about every single thing? No. What do you think faith is, my friend? What do you think, you know, why do you think we're called to believe him? We're called to believe him based upon the information he provides. But that is not to say he has provided every single drop of information that there is. Could he have said, for instance, you know, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. And one trillion years later, he decided that he would go ahead now and form the earth, and he would create light, and he would create uh, the celestial bodies, and he would create this, and cre you know what I'm saying? No, it, it doesn't go into all that detail. But we as human beings have that habit of drawing all kind of inference and making all kind of assumptions. And we, you know, because after all, we're so smart. And fundamentalists, my friend, are, are famous for this stupidity of making assumptions. So... This is why, part of why I believe it is important when you look at same-sex coupling, you look beyond merely the sexual element. God didn't create Eve as a sexual partner for Adam. That was not her purpose in creation. That was not her function. Initially, that element of human existence wasn't even necessary, wasn't even it wasn't even anything that had to exist. Sexuality, procreation. Uh, let me see if I can. Whoops, I'm right out of time. I did a lot of talking today, trying to expound on some things. Let, all right, I'm going to just share a couple of quick minutes, okay, so I can. Adam and Eve did not have any children while they lived in the garden. The third chapter of Genesis expounds upon the fall of Adam and his expulsion from the Garden of Eden. It was not un until his nature was changed and his status demoted that procreation became necessary. And it was only after their transformation to the status of fallen man that they did indeed have any offspring. Genesis 4 and 1, And Adam knew Eve's wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. The passage in Genesis 1, which speaks of man being fruitful and multiplying, is clearly placed out of context and not in perfect sequence. How do we know? this to be true? Folks, again, line upon line, precept upon precept, 
here a little there. I keep saying that constantly. How do we know that this particular conversation may actually have occurred after Adam and Eve's disobedience? Let's look at the context. Genesis 1, 27 through 31. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So in Genesis 1, he's telling us he created both. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed for you it shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Nowhere in this specific passage does the Lord mention the prohibition to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He says, Behold, I've given you every tree in the garden. No, on the earth. All of a sudden, he's speaking to them of the entire planet. But wait a minute. Initially, they were confined to the garden. So why would God tell them every tree on the planet, every herb on the planet, every animal on the planet, it's there for you to subdue and blah, 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 blah. Do you follow what I'm saying? He, meaning God, also states that all the fruit-bearing trees were good for meat, meaning they could be eaten or used for food. Again, quote, which is upon the face of the earth. He's not saying, but this one tree saying, every tree is good for me. Is this a clue that perhaps this conversation really happened later, post-fall? Yes, it is a clue that this conversation happened after the fall. Because after the fall, they're expelled from the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is no longer even available to them. Okay? Originally, Adam and Eve were confined to the Garden of Eden. It's obvious that when the Lord spoke those words to Adam and Eve, they were to be traveling or sojourning. And the Lord was letting them know that wherever they went, fruit-bearing trees would be good for food. So when it is all said and done, the need for procreation presented itself after man's expulsion from the garden. Prior to this, Adam and Eve were simply to live together so that man would not be alone and work together and tend the garden of God. Okay, so that is what the original plan was. That was God's original purpose. So therefore, my friend, if God had so desired, he could have created Adam and, and Steve, as it were, okay? But instead, he created, uh, when, they, when they fell, when they uh, disobeyed the Lord, they had to take on differing natures. Why? Because we have, if, if we don't procreate, then when we die, all of humanity is gone, period. So in order for the human race to... Uh, continue, it became necessary that one have one uh, set of 
pipes and the other one have another set of pipes okay all right folks um, I hope you found this somewhat interesting and maybe a little bit um, thought-provoking um, we're going to get next week I apologize I kind of hoped I was going to get to David and Jonathan this week but I didn't we'll be getting there next week uh, but uh, I think that these these things if nothing else I hope that they're thought-provoking and they help us to realize you know um, one of the biggest conflicts we have in our world today is science claiming you know to have absolute proof that uh, the Bible is inaccurate and wrong and we have Christians on the other hand screaming oh no the Bible is true and you're wrong you know and the scientific world looks at us and laughs and uh, this preacher looks and says I don't know based on what I read I'm not sure they're both not right I, I see I see room I see the possibility uh, when you just simply stop assuming facts that are not in evidence and stop assuming things uh, that are not stated and just let the Word of God say what it says. Amen. And I say that over and over again. That's what we need to do. So anyway, I hope this Bible study has been encouraging to you. I hope there's something in here that I've said today that's been a blessing and uh, help to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayers. We close this evening. Master, we love you. We thank you, God, for this time together. We thank you, Lord for the word of God what a wonderful trove of revelation exists for us in the word of God just about the time we think we know all the answers Lord all of a sudden our eyes are opened and we're made to realize that there are there are facts there are truths that may have escaped our observation for eons centuries millennium Master, in the name of Jesus, go with us from this place, O God. Allow us to meditate upon that which we've heard. Master, in the name of Jesus, let this study be eye-opening. Let it be encouraging. Let it bring peace. Let it bring reconciliation to the hearer, that they might understand that they most certainly have a place in the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God is consists of those imperfect though we may be who have by faith embraced and believed the gospel and master we walk by faith not by sight our righteousness is not ours by reason of our own conduct or our own behavior but it is ours by reason of our faith oh master today go with us god keep us in your care protect your people sickness disease violence abounds in the world in which we live keep every one of your children today under the protective hand of almighty god for we ask it in jesus wonderful name amen i hope you'll be with us sunday at three o'clock central standard time for a celebration of our life in christ and then of course next wednesday at seven o'clock central standard time we will have yet another um, time of Bible study, and I hope you'll join us for that as well. Until we meet again, God bless you in Jesus' name is our sincere prayer.